Hey YouTube, figured I'd bring you a little teardown video today. I've got this cheap little cell phone signal amplifier that I uh, picked up out of a scrapyard for maybe like two or three bucks because it's all just scrap metal value. So this unit on the back it says is 1.7 gigahertz. It looks like the uplink going in this direction towards the outdoor antenna is 1.755 gigahertz and downlink is around 2.155 megahertz towards the indoor antenna. I didn't bother picking up the indoor antenna and in Yagi just because well, it's just garbage to me. This is the interesting bit for teardown. So I already pulled all the screws out to save some time. And here we go. I guess also of note, this cover, you can see it's got these uh, wire meshes. These are RF gaskets and they help make good contact because this is just a die cast zinc lid. So it's, it's basically pot metal. It's super cheap to just die cast and it's not really machined to any degree. You can even see maybe on camera how some of the metal flowed and crystallized on uh, manufacture. But anyways, that's garbage. So here's the inside of the cell phone signal amplifier. Uh, this is the outdoor antenna. This is the indoor antenna. Come back here. All right, outdoor, indoor antenna. It looks like this entire section is basically empty and you've got these two distinct paths here. So what do we got? Well, first off, taking a look at this, this guy here and this guy here are what are known as circulators. What they do is they split power going in different directions. So if you've got signal coming in through here from the indoor antenna, it's going to hit the circulator and it can only go down one of these paths. It won't go down the other. And vice versa, if you've got signal coming towards the indoor antenna, it's going to go only towards the output port and not feed back into the other side of the circuitry. Uh, and same over here where power coming out of the amplifier stage for the uplink will only feed to the outdoor port and not feed back into the uh, downlink circuitry. Vice versa, it only circulates in one direction between the three different ports. Now this is all micro strip line circuitry as well. So these circulators are actually pretty cheap and obviously you can't see it on camera, but it's ever so slightly ferromagnetic. Um, it's very weak because these are very small circulators, but I can feel it in the screwdriver that they are, so it's a dead giveaway because circulators have little tiny ferrites in them to cause the wave to circulate through the cavity. It's a bunch of RF black magic, that's all you need to know, right? Okay, so what do we have here? Chances are this is the, oh, actually no, it says right here, 1700 up, 1700 down. So I was right, it goes in this direction and comes back in this direction. So let's look at the uplink side first. There are a bunch of unlabeled ICs, but you can see that there's uh, what looks like either an RC, more like an LC circuit right here. I don't know what this chip is here, but these likely form some kind of a filter. This is another filter here. There's this intermediate power transistor um, yeah, so this is power transistor. This probably band passes it, um, just to the uplink frequency of, what was it again? 1.755 gigahertz. And then we've got a couple more filters. I don't know what these two chips are. U38, sorry, U68 and U31. Again, these are all super fine printing. I couldn't even see it under a microscope if I wanted to, or they're not labeled at all. And then we've got this little guy here, which is definitely an RF transistor, because you've got this round package, four pins, that's designed to fit right into micro strip line at a particular impedance. And then it feeds back into the circulator and then back to the output port. On the downlink side, what do we got here? Um, what looks to be a another bandpass filter. It's interesting that the path goes through two different routes here where there's one strip line here and one strip line there. I'm not quite sure why, but all I know is that the signal's coming in this direction. There's a little bit of loose solder in there. Um, yeah, so the signal's coming in this direction. 
it hits this little intermediate transistor. You also note that some of these components are mounted at angles because just the way the manufacturers recommend you route the micro strip line uh, in certain directions for best impedance. So yeah, we've got two different paths here. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's going on here. It, it seems to want to be in two different paths, recombine, then split back up again, uh, and then recombine here at the output stage. I don't know if this is like a an IF being mixed in or something. I don't know what that chip is. Um, it looks, well, to be a similar package as that guy. Regardless, you've got this, uh, I guess, lower power transistor. This is probably just for preamp, just like this guy. And this is the actual output power amplifying transistor, which, well, it mentions that uplink uh, plus 60 dB, downlink 65 dB. So what that actually means in dBm, I don't know because when you mention stuff in dB, it's just a logarithmic gain from what the input is. dBm is actually millivolts. Well, I guess, yeah, if, if you mention it in that way, it does make a little more sense. Um, but yeah, it's, this is actually an amazingly simple circuit. I might actually just hold on to this little RF amplifier on the off chance that it actually becomes useful in the shop. 1.7 gigahertz is a little bit weird. I don't think it sits in the ham bands, and I'd have to do some real jiggery pokery to reverse engineer this, so I doubt I'll ever get to use this for amateur radio, but it's kind of neat to see how this micro strip line is so cheaply manufactured, and they just use these card edge SMA connectors to tie everything together. But yeah, it's just a quick little teardown video of what's inside one of these little cell phone amplifiers. Um, I think for comparison's sake, this is a this is a much lower frequency um, preamp. This is this preamp is actually out of um, a mass spec for counting signals. So let's just have a quick poke inside here and just see what's under the hood. It's for scientific equipment, so of course it's going to be expensive. So what's under the cover here? Oh, there we go. You can even see revision B. This is nicely machined billet, aluminum, steel, steel. We've got a couple of trim pots, which I will not dare touch. Uh, we've got a power input. They even put a little uh, diode in here to make sure you don't reverse power this, kind of because like this whole assembly costs a whole ton of money. And it looks like you've got a whole series of little tiny MOSFETs, little FET amplifiers. One, two, three, four, five. There's probably a little bit of filtering that goes on. Actually, all of this looks like it's power supply decoupling here and any auxiliary filtering is probably happening down here. And in fact, that actually makes a lot more sense. This carrier board is probably meant for utilities purposes. They make one PCB carrier and they populate it and then change these values for the uh, time constants and everything else that they want for filter filtering uh, the signal coming in. So this is the input port, this is the output port. These are all identical power filter circuits coming in from this power rail that's on the top, right? Power comes in this trace, it's underneath all of these resistors here, or sorry, capacitors that are decoupling it to the ground plane, which is actually coupled through the case to here. There's no second wire, which would almost imply that this is aluminum, not steel, because that would be pretty bad to pass current through. It's resistive, but it's Still, there's no direct connection from the shield. And anyway, all these power filter circuits are identical. It looks like they've got different uh, values of resistors and capacitors to smooth things out. And then you've got what looks to be an RC, an RC, an RC, and an RC network here uh, with more room for additional components on the bottom. Um, and it's interesting that they use trim caps here that are the identical footprint as other capacitors, so they can just slot these in as needed. Um, and they probably don't change a silkscreen very much either. But uh, yeah, it's amazingly how simple one of these little 
uh, tiny devices are, these block elements that you feed a signal and you feed a signal out and you just get the result uh, of what it's supposed to do perfectly every time. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what goes on in one of these little uh, fast preamps as well. So this is probably in the kilohertz to maybe a megahertz range and then you start getting into micro strip line design with one of these guys where you have to have controlled impedance between the trace and the ground plane and as you get to higher and higher signal frequencies you have to change the substrate so it's dielectric constant is less lossy for your signal traveling through the micro strip line and as you get higher uh, frequency or lower intensity signals you're going to start to completely shield them by burying the trace between ground planes on either side of the board in a multi-layer board. RF is black magic and these little block amplifiers are nice components to have when you just want to feed a signal and feed a signal out and get your result reliably. So that's it for now. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and comment.